So we're digging away this dirt, uh, dirt pal platform down here. Obviously safety measure, tied off because sooner or later what I'm on is going to collapse and I don't really want to go down because it's a significant drop. Curious to see how this comes apart here while I'm standing on it. So here we go. Right now it's looking like the deepest shaft in Ontario. And this ladder doesn't even go part way down. I'm going to go down and have a look. You'll live on YouTube forever, my friend. So I'm here in the little town of Staffa. We're right on the edge of the sinkhole plain. Um, this is typified. The town itself is kind of building up onto the side of a moraine. And uh, moraines are, uh, seem to have a connection in Ontario to where the karst areas are. And I'll explain the reason for that in a bit here. But... Um, yeah, it's, it's the right, uh, there's definitely a, a large area around here that I visited uh, a couple of months ago, just before this COVID situation. Yeah, so moraines, right? Now, there is a connection in Ontario. I mean, you can see here, there's a, a heaping of earth behind me, and a moraine is basically at the front end of a glacier. The glacier is churning and pushing up the soil in front of it, and often it forms uh, a dam between the actual front of the ice and the soil that it's pushed up. And that dam uh, will have a, a, a pressure head that forces water down. And that's happened many places, glaciers, caves, karst areas in Ontario. Uh, Rockwood being a good example. Uh, you can see a moraine in Rockwood, which behind which there are sinkholes. I mean, the pressure head and um, above uh, Leopard Frog Cave near Tobamori. Uh, basically entrapped there beneath the glacier. Um, numerous other examples, but anyway, this is on the edge, just outside Staffa. This is on the edge of the sinkhole plain. Um, why sinkholes? You know, what's the interest? Well, the point is, sinkholes, the water goes down, and beneath that you'll often find uh, cave tunnels. Uh, some are accessible by humans, some are not. I mean, here's your first interesting little feature. You can see a little stream running and then just kind of middle of the field disappears. I guess this used to be an old stream bed because behind me I can see the stream actually flowing. And right over there, this is just on the other side of this moraine, right over there the actual stream goes down a, some kind of a hole, man-made. And uh, I don't know where it's going but it's not unusual in this area for farmers to make use of the natural sinkholes and so forth and uh, tap the field drainage down into the sinkhole. You pretty well, moraine carries all sorts of unsorted boulders, you know, not graded according to size. They're usually, usually water-worn. Um, so you can see down at the bottom of the moraine here, just outside Staffa, you know, a whole range of probably something from down beneath here and something from a long way away. This particular drainage stream uh, they say it drains uh, 1,900 hectares. Somewhere behind me, upstream, it's dropping down some cracks. And in some of the reports on, on, on the uh, web there, it's basically saying that there's a significant echo from down below. So it's going down the crack and it's echoing. It's taken a lot of water away. This whole area is filled with, you know, sinkholes and various karst features but obviously the soil's not very thick around here i got a feeling if we could get permission to do some digging in the bottom of some of these sinkholes we'd be into some primo caving territory i mean the geology is right the geography is right you just got to apply some some human effort and you know that's we've opened up some pretty decent you know places just by you know digging away so you got a, a drainage off the fields goes along, along the tree line. See where those lumps are down at the far end there? It just sinks. Huge amount of water going down underground here. Landowner just gave me permission to have a look. Pretty excited. You can see it's all backing up. But that's, that's one heck of a flow. Going down. Not sure where it's going but it's going underground here. 
based on the amount of water flowing into the uh, sink area and then the amount passing off into the field it says it's taking most of the flow but not all of the flow so a little bit's draining that way most of it is going straight down the wind's pretty bad out here so I don't know what you can hear from me but here but right beside the road we got some pretty decent sized sink and a bunch of soil pipes so as I think I said before there the sink the, the catchment area is the area where water falls and all of it goes down into that particular sinkhole. Quite a large catchment area here. Um, the soil is pretty well clayish as well, which really does help. Um, the fact that the water doesn't just sink into it right away and enter the aquifer at all sorts of dispersed points, it is channeled to that sinkhole. So here's an example. We got a soil pipe we'll look at first and then we'll peek down a sinkhole. Then I'm going to go over there and ask these people if I can go back and check out the sinkhole in the bottom of the, of the creek. Now that's not called a sinking stream, it would be called a losing stream. It loses some of its water to the aquifer, but not all. So okay, without further ado, soil pipe, and then we'll look at the sinkhole. So that's what we mean by a soil pipe. Just down through the soil, it's at what point a soil pipe becomes a sinkhole is a matter of opinion, I guess. I'm sure someone's defined it. Here's your sinkhole. Um, looks like probably two distinctive sinkholes. One there, one over there. I'm back here years and years ago to see this uh, losing stream. And uh, the landowner's going to take me out again. He's going to take his four-wheeler. I'm going to follow him. And uh, we're going to be able to see where it actually sinks down into the, uh, into the bedrock. Oddly, I had now, it's all coming back to me. I remember this place. We actually did a dig here. Yeah. That big, and she disappeared right down there. Really? Yeah, so this is what we were digging. Um, I guess it captures water. It probably runs right across the middle of the creek as well. Does the creek ever stop in this area? Uh, you know, at the crash, it's somewhere really dried up pretty much. Right. So this is downstream of the uh, upper washable. And uh, the sink point we were looking at is just up that way. But um, I was talking with Gary, that's the gentleman who showed me around. And his son has been interested by, uh, you know, where does, where does all the water come out that goes in from this whole area? And I guess he goes fishing down at the mouth of the Sauble River, where it enters uh, Lake Huron there. And uh, there's a spot down there where, not far from where the water enters the river, or where the water enters the lake, where suddenly the temperature changes quite drastically. So, I mean, it's a possibility. Uh, it definitely enters within the lake, and uh, the water table here is no higher than uh, three meters uh, above that of uh, Lake Huron. So, it would indicate what they say is a very, very uh, permeable uh, aquifer. So, this, uh, this permeable aquifer, as they say, um, one of the things is, when there's a, a flood, the, uh, the water that's flowing down a conduit, which is the, the path of travel, the water flowing down the conduit uh, rises. The water table around that conduit rises quite drastically. Um, I can't recall exactly what it was, but I think in the, in the Tucker Smith area, it rises up to 10, 10 meters um, over a certain time period. And by, uh, that's usually in April, and then by um, September, there's a trough around the conduit. Again, indicating how well uh, the drainage is taking place. A trough in the water table. So you'll see kind of like a, if you were able to measure the height of the water, you would see the tunnel, and all around the tunnel, the water table is dropping or dipping. So the fact that that is so obvious in this area would suggest that uh, there are indeed some pretty uh, well-established conduits 
or paths of water travel underground. Well, I'm kind of excited here. This is the Tuckersmith sink now. This and the Chislehurst are probably amongst the bigger of the sinks. Although the catchment area for this is quite small, it's a pre pretty significant size, um, quite a depth. One of the things to keep in mind here is that Chislehurst and the Tuckersmith sinks both have a very rapid rise and drop of the water table around them. In other words, the trough and the mound. Chislehurst, I believe it takes between 15 and 23 hours to rise up around three meters. This one will rise to a distance of four meters over about a hundred and a hundred hours or something like that. It would say that this one has a much more permeable area around it, possibly a conduit that may be a lot larger than say the Chislehurst, which is just a, a perfect shaft going down. Anyway, let's go have a look at it. So it's just kind of a small creek, but who's to really say how things flowed in the past? I mean, the sinkhole has the water now channeled to it in a way that's been sculpted by man and woman, whatever, along the edge of their farmer's fields. In the past, during glacial times, it could have been an entirely different situation. Wow, look at this turning into quite the, uh, quite the little valley. Again, this has quite a small catchment basin. It seems to be quite a significant hole. Very, very interesting. The Tuckersmith sink, guys. <laughs> so, it's backing up a bit. You can see, see the soil pipes all around the edges. So I would imagine some very large underground conduit here. Now one of the things to think about here based on the fact that this is a flood, dry, dry spell kind of system, is the fact that usually when tunnels form beneath the water table, they form in either an elliptical or a circle, circular cross section, right? That's called ferratic, formed beneath the water table. Usually the water's moving a little bit slower. The reason being, if you can imagine a single point, solution of the limestone is even all the way around that single point. However, when you get this kind of situation where most of the year the tunnel is unlikely to be beneath the water table, I don't know how far down the water table is, but this water, based on the fact it's, it takes a while to start filling up to, a, to the height that it's, it's backflowing here, a good chunk of that tunnel will be above the water table, which leads to what is known as Vado's flow. Think of a V where the water is running and working at the bottom of the trench that it is in. So the tunnels are more likely to be high and thin as opposed to elliptical or circular in cross-section. That's probably what's underneath us here. I find it in the field. It's a limestone. Dollar stone would be much more pocked with little cavities and holes. This is more like layered, like a limestone.